much. Last week, I dealt extensively with some issues surrounding the teacher's strike. And I pointed out using allocations in the budget, the government's commitment to the sector, and how that has grown dramatically in the past few years. Because I believe that when you assess these issues about education, you have to, first of all, deal with the question of commitment. And commitment has to be reflected in allocations to the sector. Just to repeat what I said last week, in 2020, the total budgetary allocation to the education sector was $51.4 billion. In 2025, 2024, it's $135 billion. That represents an $83.5 billion increase from 2020 to 2024. $83.5 billion more in this year, the sector is getting than it was getting in 2020. In percentage term, that's a 162% increase in the years that this government has been in office. The, from 2020 to now, we have seen a 162% increase in the allocation to the sector. So we're spending more on almost every single area, from training of teachers, massive sums going into training, to building up the infrastructure, better classrooms. We're building also new schools. Um, in, region, in Region 1 alone, we're spending now about $5 billion on three schools, which is more than the entire capital allocation for the five years that APNU was in office for the, the region, not only for that sector. We are just spending on three schools nearly $5 billion that will transform the lives of the children in these, in these areas. And that's only in Region 1. To give you an example of the massive investments that are taking place. Here in Georgetown, you see new schools all across the country. We have the allocation to upgrade classrooms and build new facilities for the sector. Outside of the salary benefit for teachers, we're, we've dedicated large sums of money to address non-salaried benefits. And these are in the budget and you can, you, you can see them. In, on wages and salaries itself, in the education sector, how much was it in 2020? It was $24.4 billion. In 2023, that's the end 2023, because we have not given the salary increase for this year as yet, it grew to $39.4 billion. So that's a $15 billion increase from 24.4 to $39.4 billion on wages and salaries for teachers. That's a 61.4% increase in allocation for wages and salaries for teachers. Now you would see the across the board figure is lower than that. And why is this so? because we have hired more teachers and we have adjusted the graduate levels significantly so that teachers who are better qualified would earn more. But people say, oh, Jack, they used to call for a 50% increase for teachers in the past and they're doing nothing about it now. Well, since we got into office, the wage bill for teachers have increased by 61.4%, or from 24.4 20, billion to 39.4 billion. 
These are figures you can verify. That represents a commitment. 61, and so teachers are getting in these years $15 billion more this year teacher would be getting. In fact, not this year, up to end last year, because this year they'll get a new salary increase too. But up $15 billion more than they were getting in 2020 or 2019. So these are facts that you cannot hide from. These are facts that you cannot hide from. The, whether we were are treating the union with respect or not, we have gone back to discussions with the union. On the 31st of January 2024, the Ministry of Education met with the teachers' union. Their union had written to them, and from, from the report from the Ministry of Education, they had raised some 40-odd issues with them to be addressed. The ministry has dealt with 27, nearly 30 of those issues, they told me. And that, you saw it reflected in the newspapers. It was published, all the things that they addressed. Since they had several meetings, and the latest was on the 31st of this January 2024. At that meeting, they agreed that every third, third Wednesday, they will meet continuously. Every third Wednesday, they will meet continuously. The next meeting was supposed to take place on the, the 21st of February. The union went on strike. When they saw that the issues were being dealt with. So not, we can, not all the issues, but a significant amount of the issues had been dealt with in meetings with them, and they had planned meetings again. So this argument that they could not meet with the education ministry, etc., is patently false. They had a meeting. I spoke up to today with the officials of the ministry. And they told me, yes, we met. We agreed that we'll meet every, every third, third Wednesday. We addressed all of these issues. So, so for those who believe that they had no access to the ministry, they were not meeting with ministry of officials, they have been misled to believe that. So the, Kaichou News and a few others, I saw Starbuck in one editorial, pointed out to my position when we were in opposition. And they said, first of all, I contrast how, where the government could find resources from. At that time, I pointed out that there were several areas where the expenditure had grown significantly. And I pointed out the rentals, et cetera, that could be adjusted. But the key point, if you go back to even the article in Kaicho News, which distorts everything in, that I say, even if you go back there, you would see that the key contention of mine, that they were not meeting the multi-year agreement that they had on the my presidency had come to an end. And they, they had no meeting whatsoever. They refused to meet with the teachers' union. And I was saying, you need to meet with the teachers' union. It was not an advocacy for a specific percentage. If you check any, any of the, the reports from the period when we were in opposition, you'd never see me advocate for a specific percentage. You will see that I urge them to meet. And my point was, if you could find money to pay a 50% increase for ministers the three weeks after you get into office, then you can find money for the teachers. That is what I was saying. If you could find money for ministers, they found money not only for a 50% increase for ministers, but then they went on to change the per diem policy. They went on to change the, the policies 
where ministers would have security and several drivers and personal assistance of uh, uh, several of those. They went on to, to spend more on insurance, health insurance for ministers and their families. I said, if you can do all of these things for the ministers, why can't you find more resources for the teachers? We haven't increased ministerial salaries outside of the percentages that the public servants get. They get the same percentages now. We have not done that. And yet we have found resources to increase the budgetary allocation by 61% for wages and salaries in the education sector and 162% for the overall sector, moving $83 billion more to spend on education. So this represents a commitment to our country, to our teachers. I pointed out that in two years alone, if you have 14,000 teachers, in two years alone, in the teachers' training college, we train nearly 2,000 teachers, Cyril Potter College, through that program. 2,000 teachers of the 14,000, unprecedented in our history, so that they can get more money, because if you're trained, you get a higher, higher salary. We have 4,000 people on gold scholarships. The gold scholarships didn't exist in the past under APNU, but 4,000 teachers now are on that program. So when you talk about commitment to education and teachers, you've seen the ratio of teachers to students. It's some of the lowest in the world. I saw one disingenuous kind of um, approach by some, some so-called teacher from the region, and I see carried in the Kaicho News, about comparing gross domestic product with teachers', teachers pay the growth in gross domestic product. Right here, Kimal asked me a question about GDP and purchasing power parity. And I, I pointed out that growth in GDP doesn't mean it doesn't have, the, it's not a direct link or directly correlated to distribution of income. And secondly, growth, you don't look at growth in GDP, particularly when the economy is enclavic that you have to look at growth in overall revenue. So if you mirror teachers' wages growth compared to growth in revenue, then you will see a significant part of the, how high it is, how high it is as a share of revenue. And, and so that is what you have to look at. And, and, and so we, we have, um, we have been, there, there were meetings with the union. The union was treated differently than in the past. And we were, we are spending money to improve our overall health uh, education sector. But one thing we cannot do is to look only at education. Teachers and others have to benefit from hundreds of other things in this country. Better health care will impact teachers too. And that's why I pointed out that the investments right across this country, where the 12 hospitals are right across the new hospitals, that within two years' time will produce modern health care. Don't you think the teachers and our children will benefit from that? Don't you think if they have to fly to Georgetown to get a CT scan and they can do it just in the regions now for free, it will impact on teachers and their well-being? The, the, the hundreds of billions we're spending on putting in infrastructure for roads um, in how, new housing schemes now to produce house lots. You, do you think many teachers are getting these house lots too? Then that's why the last time I saw the Kaicho news, I shifted to, I didn't deal with the core question of income. I dealt with non-salaried benefits. But it's, it, we live in an integrated society and those investments matter Two, they matter. Now, the last time I spoke, I pointed out about the credibility of this union. I said, first of all, it's a political strike, we believe, because they were engaging with the ministry. They cho chose to en end those engagements and go out to strike, but it links back to our intelligence, what 
Apnu had promised the first day of um, first day of this year. They issued a press statement to say that the countdown to elections had started. And they were urging a number of politically aligned people in unions to come out and start with industrial action first to create unease in the country that they can benefit from. APNU can't mobilize a crowd on its own. We have demonstrated that over and over again. They cannot mobilize people on their own. They have no credibility. They couldn't even do it around the, the, the period when they tried to steal the elections. People didn't bother with them. So how do they get people to, to support them is by expressing crocodile tears or symbolic sympathy with the sections of the working class. The teachers union and others, they're urging other unions to, take, to come out so that when there is an industrial action, they go on the ground as been being demonstrated, the fossils weigh in, first of all. The Lincoln Lewis would come out, they rolled him out, and then the and then the Hamilton Green and the Christopher Rams and the Gary Bess, they roll in and start going to the picket lines and expressing sympathy and the up new people start posting. It's an old playbook. It's an old playbook. We have dealt I've dealt with this for many, many years. Many, many years. When smarter people than they, that this current bunch were heading the PNC. There were much smarter people in the past who were heading the PNC, and we dealt with this. And, and even when Mr. Hoyt could bring 5,000 people on the street by just going on the television, we had to deal with all of this. And so we see the old playbook, and the characters have not changed. The, best, the, uh, the, the Lincoln Lewis's and the Christopher Ram, they haven't changed much. The same old characters here, again, playbook, old playbook. So we've seen that, we know this also. So they're not interested in engagement. It's, it's political. So we have demonstrated that. This crime is about political. Secondly, they mislead a lot of the union members. They've grossly misled them. So we've seen now them claiming in the early days, the strike was effective. 60% of the teachers are out. The whole education system is crippled. And Starbuck News, even in their editorial, said that we were shocked by the sizable um, numbers of teachers who came out. So I thought that they will now claim the same numbers. I was shocked to hear Mr. Light saying, we don't know how many teachers struck. So it could be 60%, it could be 30%, it could be 40%, it could be 25%, it could be 20%. That's his last figure he came up with now. So from 60% that they claim and they're pronounced, and the media pronounced, the president of the union has now said he doesn't know how many teachers struck. It could be 20%. So credibility gap. And, and some in the media, they buy it up. They buy these things like wholesale and repeat them without ever questioning people about it. So that's the, the next thing. After the next thing on credibility gap, Last week, I pointed out that they had not submitted audited statements um, to the Registrar of Trade Unions since 2004 and to the Auditor General by, since 1989. Now, what happened? The first thing, the Murar Wave met, the Murar Waves met, met one of the union leaders. He said, Jack Deo is lying again, basically. Jack Deo is lying lied in the face of what could be proven, the union leaders. And then, subsequently, when the two agencies responded by saying, it is, it's a, we checked our records, and we don't have any submissions, 
Now they're saying, making the claim that they have audited statements. They have audited statements, but we don't know who the auditors are, and we don't know why they don't submit these statements if they, could, they have them. And then we've seen the Auditor General come out and say, how come you have audited statements? I am in charge of auditing trade unions. You haven't submitted anything to me. And not a huge credibility gap. So we are lurching from one set of in misinformation about numbers striking. You see the confusion, not just confusion, but the lies they told. Now the credibility gap that they have in terms of the, what they claim about accountability and audited reports. The third area, that, and, and this is a significant issue, because they have to account for nearly $2 billion collected in this period without anybody knowing how this money was spent. Because if you don't produce financial statements, nobody knows how you, how you spend the money. So they still have to account for $2 billion of Jews that they, was, they received and then they did, not, um, they did not account for. The third issue they told the strikers, another credibility gap, so we demonstrated two cases of major lying with credibility gaps, was about the, the deductions, the payment for strike, strike. So at the beginning, Coretta McDonald bro boldly pronounced, that's clear for everyone to see now, boldly pronounced, you can deduct the money for the days we strike. We have corporate sponsors who will pay the resources. So we don't know who the corporate sponsors are. That's one. The media has probably still not asked them about this. I asked you to find out last week who collects the money from the corporate sponsors if it's paid into the union's account because they'd have to have a strike relief fund. They have to establish that as per their rules. If it's paid there, if it, is, it, is it given to individuals? Where is this money coming from? From whom and how, how much? So we pointed out that one week, if 50% were to persons were to strike in one week, that they, the sum that they would lose is $342 million. If 50% of the teachers weekly, that would be the weekly deduction. So now you're coming up to two weeks. So that's over $600 million, nearly $700 million that teachers would lose because of the, the deduction from their salaries for, not, for being on strike. So the union now has to decide where it's going to get that money from. Suddenly we hear a different story. So this is the credibility gap. From the bold pronouncement at the beginning, you, do, you deduct and we will find the sponsors. So they knew that if you take industrial action, because it's established trade union practice, that industrial action, when you take industrial action, you, um, there is a deduction. Now, they've gone to court now to say that we cannot deduct. And they're using, um, can they get some water for me, please? Yeah, they're using a different, um, a different method. So they're, they're claiming, I don't know, it's all, it's all false. But this, I'm just gonna go through. There are cases already, already, that were went through the court system all the way to the Privy Council, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, which is the final court in the region, in CARICOM, except in ours. Like most countries use that as the final court. 
except those who are, have the CCJ as part of their ju um, appellate jurisdiction. And this matter has been determined. And they upheld, there is a case of Sykes versus the Minister of National Security in Jamaica. And the Privy Council upheld the principle, no work, no pay, in industrial situation. They upheld that. They know this. They know that the case has been ventilated in the court system, and there is a ruling. Yet they continue to mislead the teachers that somehow they will defend them by filing, getting the, the weed or something like that. He loses all his cases, most, most of his cases, in any case. So he, to get him to file this, and from the bold assertion, and they knew that the, the deductions will take place. Now, oh, the government is acting vindictively because it wants to deduct money. So they knew the deduction would have taken place because there is a principle in industrial action that no work, no pay, and that is upheld by the highest court. They have now gone to ask the court to force the government to be their agent once more to, to deduct from the workers the dues, the, pen, uh, the payments that they're not accounting for. So that matter has went to the court too. And the ruling is quite clear. Justice Chang pointed out that in his ruling, and it went to the appeal court too, Chang pointed out that the government not collecting, the government is acting as your agent. If the government refuses to act as your agent to collect the Jews, it doesn't mean the Jews are not collectible. You can collect the Jews yourself. And they themselves boldly said, we're gonna use what, MMC or something, we'll use MMC to collect our Jews, forget the government. Now they've gone to court to say the government is treating us badly, etc. Look at this. It's a series of things to mislead, mislead the workers of this country. Contradictions, unbelievable levels of contradictions, and they are not held to account. So somehow we are the bad ones because we pointed out that, that they are not accountable. We are the bad ones now. It is true that the government maybe um, should take serious action against them. But you know what the serious action will be? You know what the law says? De-recognition. Are we prepared to de-recognize the union? Then they will say, we are busting unions now. That is why last week I said, we didn't want to go that route. Because if you go and de-recognize them, they would say, we hate the teachers' union, and we hate teachers. They would make it about the teachers. This has nothing to do with the teachers, because we want the teachers to have better working conditions, and that is why we're making all of this investment. This has to do with a, an unaccountable union. But what if people say to, I see a lot of people saying, oh, we are failing in our responsibilities to enforce the rules. But the enforcement of the rules will mean the recognition of the union. They can't, they, they, they will just be struck off the books. And we were not prepared to go that route. So the country should decide, should the government enforce the rules for this unaccountable behavior because the rule book is clear. The rule book is clear. The laws of the country are clear. Strike, strike off the union. So the shifting, Christopher Ram writes, oh, the government is treating Gao specially, and they're treating the union, this union, differently because Gao is sympathetic to us. Gao has had audited accounts up to 2021, audited by the Auditor General. And they already have their 2022 submission in. 2022 submission. Christopher Ram wrote something about Gao. Gao should just take legal action against him. Because instead of dealing with the unaccountability of the trade union, 
this union in particular, he suddenly shifts it. Like last week, I was asked about the sugar workers instead of dealing with this the teachers' union, and their unaccountable behavior. They, they just shift it to win sympathy out there. You know, oh, this government is biased. Gao, maybe indo Guyanese, they treated them differently. They shift it. So, so this is Im important. Now, I've had a chance to look at a rule book, and it's very interesting when coming to this press conference again because and you know now we're getting to look at these things in greater detail in, in greater details because in the past we probably were busy doing other things so it's interesting what the findings are the findings are that you could go to jail rule 33 of their rule book says members of the executive of the union could be imprisoned for three months for failing to supply these, this information. Rule 26 provides for strike relief and how much money the, the executive of the union has to determine the sum of money that they would, they would pay a strike relief. But what is interesting, and I hope that they consider it, is Rule 3. Rule 3 says membership. So you have membership of the union shall be open to all teachers who are engaged in the form of employment referred to in Rule 21A. So you have several categories, seven categories. A, active membership. B, student teachers membership. C, associate membership. So under C, something interesting pop up. Teachers who leave the classroom to serve as members of parliament, such membership to expire at the end of the individual's term of office as a member of parliament. So teachers who leave the classroom to serve as MPs, fall under associate membership. Now, McDonald is paid as a teacher. She herself said publicly when she lied that she is not receiving payment from parliament. She said, I'm only being paid as a teacher. I'm a teacher. I'm being paid as a teacher. I don't receive anything from parliament. She receives teacher's salary as well as the parliamentarian salary. So she is. For the provision of this here, she's a teacher who has left the classroom and served as a member of parliament. But in B, or, or point two under associate membership, it says associate members shall have the right to vote, but shall not be eligible to hold the office of president or general secretary. So, this is a very interesting turn of affairs, and I just, or maybe we should re read the rule book a bit more. Coretta McDonald has been the general secretary, I think, for, from 2006. But I think the, these rules prohibit you from, if you're uh, their own rules, and this is under, under case law. This is the contractual obligation with membership. This is why they submitted their own rules. They're saying that if, if you're a member of parliament, you should not basically be the general secretary of the union. So I'm turning this over to the media. I don't know how many would follow up because sometimes they don't care too much about these things. This is just inconvenient, just focus on government. The commitment, the Starbuck News editorial, Oprah Manikchan is responsible for everything under the sun. Bad results, um, the, everything. Madia, if, if rain falls too hard, the president and Priya Manikchan, the president is undermining everything in the country, shouldn't meet with teachers. The president meets with lots of people. You've heard about 
they had an engagement with the ministry, a parallel engagement. They were a commitment to meet continuously. The president met with teachers as citizens of the country. He listened to them. It wasn't a negotiation there. He was just listening to them as a result of which there were some adjustments. And what was confirmed there is that people, almost mo er most teachers want to be paid for more qualification. It, they, because if they put in an effort, then they want to be there remunerated. And we took that into consideration. That's why the adjustments were made more at, at, at those levels. So these editorial, everything else. We don't get the credit for all the changes in the sector. No, so never mind no schools were built in Region 1 and the APNU. Oh, it's great. So how come the president and Premier Manik Chan don't get credit for the five billion we're spending on three schools built in Region 1? They only take heat for everything that goes wrong in the sector. How come they don't get credit for that? How come they don't get credit for the 4,000 teachers who are on the goal program? How come they don't get credit for the 2,000 teachers who graduated in the last two years from Cyril Potter College? They don't get credit for that. Oh, they take the heat for everything else under the sun. And guess who are the stars in this? The most unaccountable bunch of people, the union le leaders who have a huge credibility gap. They don't get questioned robustly. They have a credibility gap. I've just demonstrated this. They've lied consistently to the people of the, this country and to the union members and to the teachers. And they're po many of them are political. But just look at the strike and who is showing up for the strike itself. So I think we, we need, we are going to be working, continue to work to improve the lives of teachers, the public servants, the farmers, the bauxite workers, everybody in this country, the miners, they all have as Guyanese citizens, they all have a legitimate uh, right to, pros uh, to prosper and to get support from the government. There they have, and it's that balancing of interests that is important. Some people believe that every cent must be spent on one sector and nothing else. We, we have moved away from that a long time. We have a master plan for this country that will see everyone improve, including teachers. And you've dem seen it demonstrated here and in every sector. So we will stick with that. I believe, given the allocations to the sector, this sector has been treated fairly compared to how APNU treated it, because we have laid out our vision for the sector. And, and therefore, we'll continue, I want to continue to urge the teachers to pay attention to this. this. This is a free country, and people have a constitutional right, uh, uh, well, a freedom, a constitutional freedom to, to withdraw labor. But don't be misled. If you withdraw labor, you can't be paid for those years, not because of this big, bad government, for those days you are not working. If people think about the converse, if you can strike and receive pay for the days you strike, if I were working, I'd strike all day, every, every day in the year, 365 days. I wouldn't go to work, I'd just lie down in bed and read a book, and I'm on strike. I just do that every day of the year. It's, it's nonsensical. Common sense would tell you that. Uh, it's, but some people don't, don't act with common sense. I have here all of the, the court rulings on these matters, the ones that I spoke of. So it's, 
it's easy for the media to follow up if they're interested in this, to see that the case that they file and asking for these conservatory orders, they can't succeed before any judge because they've been determined already. Their precedents, rulings by, in this case, final courts. So they're just done to create another false sense to the workers to keep them out on strike all, all the time. I hope that the media will look at this. Um, I want to transition into before no, maybe I should deal with this. So I've been looking at the cultural news and um the distortion that takes place every week. So, but I've come to expect that. So this, I thought I said, I think I said it before, but I just need to reinforce it. This has stopped being a newspaper and it's the propaganda arm of an individual, an unhinged individual who is political. So most likely a political party. So. It is the, a party organ, like how we have the mirror, and uh, the PNC has New Nation. I don't know if they still do New Nation, but it might be still uh, there. The Kaicho News is the official arm of a political party. So when they are right there, you got to expect that they would have no integrity in their writing and their articles. Week after week, they distort. You could say, spend a, hour, an hour talking about one issue, and it's either through, through um, incompetence, where so there's a whole deal of this too, and then because they have to distort what you say to suit their political end, the end result is different. So the last one. Let me just give you a couple. Jack Dew defends spending billions on failing sugar industry but refuses to raise teachers' salaries. That was last week. So I think it was Dennis who asked me about this uh, collective bargaining. And I spoke about the sugar workers, how many were laid off by APNU. And I didn't see this sense of outrage. And secondly, I spoke about the wages and salaries of the remaining sugar workers. That in the five years, they got zero increase in their salary under APNU. All five years of APNU, the wages they had when APNU took office was the same salary, uh, wages and salaries they had when APNU left office. And there are thousands of people where was this civil society? Where was Kaicho News and Stavrook News crying out about the plight of these sugar workers? Concern about a living wage for sugar workers at that time. Where were these entities, where, all of them? We hear the concept of livable wage. Can you live on it $5,000 now? Well, until now, Nearly 2,000 sugar workers are earning less than $90,000, less than $100,000 per month. Le over 2,000 people who go in the fields to work. Here, the starting grade in, in government agencies, it's between a ninety to $100,000 starting level for, for most of these the professions we're talking about, teacher, uh, well, even at the lower level. And you have 2,000 sugar workers who are still at that level. So when we move to adjust that to say a livable wage, you're going to hear the cry, oh, you're giving sugar workers more money. If the concept is livable wage, it should be livable for everyone. 
So when we start adjusting that to up to this level, to the 85,000 minimum that people complain about, the Kaicho news that can't work, you will hear the outcry again. Oh, we're, we're spending billions on the sugar industry. And but we don't want on teachers. It is, it is some of the, it's tinged with a element of racism, but also callousness, and it lacks integrity. If you had a group who was doing this consistently, they could look us in the face and say, yes, I'm concerned about workers' wages across the board. But suddenly, conveniently, they're concerned about a living wage here, but ignore five years of suffering, not from only those who were not getting a wage increase, but 7,000 of them who lost their jobs, couldn't, didn't have a job, couldn't take home an income. What about them? They didn't matter, they were invisible. And so, this is the credibility gap, Kaichur and others, like a headline like this. No way, last week, but refuses to raise teacher salaries. I've just pointed out, look, last week I defended the government's position by allocating more to the sector. You have seen it at numbers. Kaichur News, don't, some of them can't understand numbers in there. It's a hard sell to them. But it, how can you fight with a number? Compare it with any period in our history. Any period in our history when you have had to this sector alone, education sector, 85 billion, 162% increase in the education budget in a period of under four years. 162% in the overall budget or a 61.2% increase in, in the allocation for wages and salaries in the, in the period? When has that happened? But that would be lost, totally lost on Kaichur and the others. And oh, we refuse to raise teachers' wages, but we're spending money on sugar workers. These are people who toil every day in the, in, in, in the field. Jack Dale defends ExxonMobil hiding new discovery figures. I defended ExxonMobil. Clear lack of understanding. I don't see them talking much about the spill in Trinidad and in Tobago now. Because that's a vessel that's traversing the region and just toppled and it's, it's destroying Tobago's coast. That's a vessel there. At least we have $2.6 billion of $600 million there. We have a $2 billion guarantee, and, and we have assets worth more than $20 billion of the company to draw down on if something of that nature would happen. Because first, you use the $600 million, then you can draw maybe on the, pair, the, the guarantee, and then you, you can liquidate this two billion, the $20 billion of assets that this company have to go after your, to, to deal with a spill. What does Tobago have? They're, they didn't even have an oil industry. But who are they gonna go to now? But no, not a word about that too. So this here, the culture, as I said before, it, and, and the political nature of it tells you. Look at these two days. Two day, separate days, the same story they carry. Which newspaper carries the same story? They only change my picture. Jack Dale supported teacher strike in 2018 for better wages, but in 2024 he sings a different tune while in office. I dealt with that already. Jack Dale supported teacher strike in 2018, the same. Two days, carry the same story and only change your picture. This is a political uh, arm of a po political party. So you could forgive me if we don't expect there any proper journalism from them. And anyone who believes anything they say got to be crazy. Got to be crazy. They, I wanted to deal with... Uh, um, a bit, 
So, so let me let me deal with the APNU. I think they're they're caught up with their own internal fight now about the leadership and their Congress. The last time Norton accused me of sending the people to protest. So I just had a few minutes before I came here. So I was a bit puzzled the last week because I heard him accuse me there and then a lot are here, my staff told me. And I said, how come he could accuse me? I don't know about there was a protest. So I, I found out apparently you had a busload of people who came and spoke about Congress and them rigging, him, rigging the, the register and all sorts of things. And it was organized by some of his competitors. And, uh, and so it was PNC people protesting there. It had nothing to do with the PPP. But they have, they have been um, unusually quiet today. I didn't see any press conference. But they had the, a statement earlier this week and in that statement, it says the gas to energy project was initiated by the APNU AFC government. So their concept of initiation is a weird one. They initiated the Linden Bridge by doing a study in 2016, but just sat on the study, it got dust. The Japanese did a study, like anybody, on a, an alternative power source and then the IDB did one, and that's how they initiated the gas to energy project, some studies done. They, anybody who had any sense knows that you had to go this route. A study to look at feasibility. They, oh, they had in their mind to repave the, the linden Dyke Highway. It was in their mind, so they claimed that too. They initiated that. They really don't understand what it takes to get a project going. You would recall when we got into office, we, we said it, this is the way to go in opposition, gas to energy project. When we got into office, we discovered no, they haven't even selected a site. They have not selected a site. They have not, so nothing, nothing has moved on the project, but not even a site selection. So we heard by, in the grapevine that some APNU people were buying up lands by my village that because they were hoping to take the pipeline there. It turned out to be true. So we said, let's quickly look at several sites. Wales, um, the Crab Island, and the East Coast here by Eccles. We looked at the feasibility study of the different sites we settled on Wales. We, it took us nearly two years to put together this project. Financing, drawing, everything, concept. Hard work. I told you about that already in the past. I don't want to belabor it. And now, now they're claiming that. First, it was disastrous. It would be good. Glenn Lyle says it's a waste of time. So they conclude that it would be unlikely to reduce the cost of electricity by 50% without a substantial subsidy. This is bunk. I've sat here and explained how this is, is done. That the project economics alone would allow you at a $2 billion spending for the pipeline, even $2 billion, and maybe 700 million, 800 million, 760 million for the, for the power plant, and the, in fact, a, a billion dollars for the, the pipeline, 750 million for the, 760 million for the, the NGL facility and the power plant, and about 150 million dollars for the transmission main, so a two billion dollars approximately project. How the sale of the liquids alone could amortize not just the pipeline, but pay back for the loan on the power plant and the NGL facility. Only the sale of the liquid. 
So the a byproduct of cleaning the gas, which is cooking gas and other derivatives, could pay back, service that debt. So in effect, if the, the gas is zero, the price of gas zero, and your, your output, which is the, the non-electricity output can pay back for the capital cost, effectively you're generating power at zero cents. But if you include all of that, leaving out, leaving out the repayment schedule, which is coming from, from the sale of the liquids, it's four cents, four to five cents per kilowatt hour. That is if you are borrowing to repay the total cost. We're, we're generating at 22 cents per kilowatt hour now. We're selling at 22 cents per kilowatt hour. We'd be producing power, 300 megawatts, at about 4 to 5 cents per kilowatt hour. If we sell it for 11 cents, we still can make money. It's as simple as that. So, they, Elson Lowe did this, I got it, but he is known for not knowing anything. And so that's, that's, um, that is, I suspect, it's shoddy shoddy stuff again that they that's all they put out this week and then they i think they latch on to kaicho news about ring fencing playing playing games with kaicho news with ring fencing the the final point i wish to address is um you know ghana is sharing the security council um this month so President Ali was there at the signature event, a launch a chairmanship of, of the Security Council. It's, it's, it's a great honor for us to chair the Security Council, and I would urge people to pay attention to the, to the President's um, speech. Um, I'm told by Caroline Rodriguez that it's an event that a large number of people have chosen to speak at, a large number of the members of the United Nations, uh, much more than many other events that are held by the Security Council. And um, it represents, a, uh, I think, a great interest in the areas that the country chose and President Ali um, spoke on. It's basically the impact of conflicts and war on food security and the environment. You know food security and the environment are two key pillar, pillars of our national approach to, to providing solutions to the world on. We believe in the energy security, food security, and also the environment. And I think on all three uh, fronts, we are now punching above the weight class in these areas. But it would be interesting, and I hope that the media will pay attention to the points that he outlined here. They're crucial, and they would have a big impact on the world, and that's why it has so much resonance with a lot of people. Thank you. Yes, go. Good afternoon, Trina Williams, Ghana Chronicle. Um, going back to the huge credibility gap um, from GTU, we would have seen GTU President Mark Light calling on teachers to put their houses on the line and make sacrifices. However, this rhetoric is not anything new. As in 2018, we would have seen um, GTU say that they can provide strike relief. My question is, do you think that teachers need to be more stern in knowing how their dues are being expended? Yes, so um, clearly teachers have to hold the union more accountable. As I said before, if we take the purely legalistic approach, then the results would be one 
that we don't want to contemplate at this point in time. Because ultimately, it ends with the derecognition of the union. And we don't want to go that route. That's if you go based on compliance with the law. Um, a lot of people are critical of us not defending their interests in that regard. But it's, it's a mood, it's something that we don't want to do. But the teachers themselves can ask more questions because under, under the rules, you will see that they're supposed to get benefit. A number of benefits are listed there for teachers. For example, if they have a debt in their family, if they need some assistance, some money, et cetera. It's the, the union from the Jews should really be assisting them. I've seen some teachers saying we've contributed large numbers, well, over a large number of years to the by paying Jews. And I had this issue and I approached the union, never got a cent from them. Never got a cent. So really, the Jews are really not to, to fat foul, to use a word, the union executives. But as the Jews are there to accumulate so you can provide strike relief in the future if you have to take industrial action and to assist your members in, in times of need. So the teachers have to hold the union more, more accountable. It's interesting that the entire scenario played out on the APNU in 2018, similar to this. And the voices that I hear today didn't come, come out at that time. Although, there's, you had 61%. You didn't have all these teachers trained, thousands of them on scholarship and how many trained. 61% less money for wages and salaries. You didn't have, they had a lower salary at that point in time. They didn't have duty free for senior um, the, the senior masters who were within three years of retirement, all of that came under this government. They didn't have like the 27 issues you saw in the newspaper resolved. And you didn't hear that outrage here. Now we have tried to address all of these issues in the last three years, and now there is outrage. So I think the teachers have to do more of this. The teachers have to do that. Ask for more accountability and where their, the money went. Let me parse Guyana Chronicle. I have two questions for you today. Ahead of the 2025 elections, can we see campaign financing laws being rolled out as recommended by the COI into our last elections? And last week, Guyana's EU ambassador uh, would have disclosed that the government would have reached out to have a observer mission from the EU in the upcoming elections. Can you say if the government has reached out to any other organizations? Um, the, the government has to invite the international observers. So in an engagement with the European Union, we're told that there are a large number of countries that are requesting missions to observe their elections and they have a long planning cycle so we have if we're interested we should invite send an early invitation so i think that has been done because we want as many international observers in guyana as possible campaign finance is something that is in our manifesto too we spoke of it so we have to strengthen provisions about campaign financing good afternoon dr chagdio and our William sky Tree news i have quite a few questions firstly we look at teachers All right, let's deal with Move four on. at a time yeah two at a time is five two at a time All right. All sir right, go with four go with the first four Yes. You have spent a lot of time complaining about GTU and its accountability. Membership of any trade union is a private matter, but your government has expended billions of taxpayers' money on cash grants since 2020, but we are yet to see any audited statement of these exercises. 
How do you reconcile this? And in the interest of transparency, would you release the list of all the recipients of the farmers and small businesses grants? Yeah, so this here, the records are, are there. We account for every year for every cent that's spent because we submit ourselves to the Auditor General. The financial records of um, to the Auditor General for auditing. And we have a proud track record of doing so in the PVP government. Because when we got into office, there was a 10 years gap in which no accounts for the country were, were submitted or audited. 10 years, the whole 1980s practically, no account for the country was audited. That was the period when we accumulated the most debt, etc. From every single year we've been in our office, from 1992, the first year, we have submitted to the Auditor General the statements to be audited. And those statements, those audited records are tabled to the Parliament, to a subcommittee that is now chaired by the opposition, the Public Accounts Committee, and they can question any element of the public record, including the ones that you've just mentioned, and they can ask for records of this. So it is audited, and it is, I'm not going to commit to you again because you will distort it, because you've been asking all the time in Kaicho News, can we, can we get... Um, the record for the people publish the big mining companies. And for three years, it was a big issue. And we got it published, and nothing. What has happened? You haven't even carried a story on it. You're just looking for distortion. So yes, the accounts are audited, the public accounts, and the members of the public accounts committee can request any information. So that's it. Yes, what's the next question? Salary talks for teachers are being dealt with by the Office of the President. What are the conditions the teachers' union has to meet for talks to commence on a multi-year salary package? All right, go on. We are in the second week of protest by teachers. At what stage of this industrial action will the government relent and meet with the union? Yeah, go on. What do you say to teachers who are being asked by President Ali to be patient while you're admitting that the country is foregoing present benefits for future gain by not ring-fencing existing and upcoming projects? Oh, ring fence again? <laughs> okay, so um, the first one is when are we going to relent and meet with the unions? They had meetings. I just demonstrated to you that they had meetings that were ongoing. They met on the 31st of January. They had a meeting scheduled for the 21st of February based on an understanding that the ministry will meet continuously every third Wednesday in every month. They walked away from that and called a political strike. So they had an engagement. Um, the next thing is salary talks are not done by OP. I don't understand what salary talks are done by the office of the president. We, we have never engaged with, with people. This, the discussions always take place in, uh, at that level, that, the discussions. When the president met with the, with the because they're using what the, the meeting with the president, that was not a negotiation with the head teachers about, or the leadership of the union, um, not the union, the, teach, the teaching body on wages and salaries. That was not a negotiation there. The president was listening to them as citizens of this country. So um, the, on the question of patience because of ring fencing, I've dealt with the ring fencing issue a million times before. I'm not going to deal with it anymore. I've made the point already about why we have to, to deal with this issue the way in the, in the manner we're dealing with it. 
So I'm not going to go back to ring fencing again. I dealt with it a million times. Yes, please. Moving over to the... They have some more. That's four from Kaichor, yes. I guess Moving they, over to the oil sector. Moving over to the oil sector now. So um, you, you, we, well, it's in the public domain that there was an oil spill in Trinidad and some stories would have been carried on it. On this front, um, Trinidadian officials are saying that the two vessels involved in the spill were destined for Guyana. I, I don't know about that. They were, first, they didn't know anything about it. They were trying to find out from us whether the vessels came to Guyana. So I'm not sure. But even if they're destined for Guyana, any vessel from any part of the world destined for Guyana could, could, could topple over, could sink, and then create problems anywhere in the world. So would we stop vessels coming from, from Guyana? So were they bringing the oil to Guyana? They were, were they bringing this oil to Guyana? That's the question for you, sir. Oh, okay. Stop. So, uh, my questions. Okay. Are you concerned that Guyana could face any legal ramification from this spill and its impact on marine life? Legal ramification for what? A vessel that... What? Explain that. There was a statement that was released by Trinidad and Tobago, and it said that the the vessel was destined for Guyana when it toppled and those spills occurred. And currently there is um, approximately, I think, 15 kilometers of Tobago shore that they're trying to clean up with all of this. No, you're, you're, not, you're not explaining the, the sensible thing. So the logic is that you're saying that the logic, if a vessel is leaving the United States of America destined to Barbados, privately owned vessel, and sinks off the coast of the Bahamas, that Barbados now, a sovereign country, must bear responsibility for that vessel. Because it's a private vessel coming to the country to do private business there. The, the state of Barbados must be responsible for this bill. Is that the logic? Is that the logic? That, is that the logic? Well, it's, it's, it's stupid. It's not sensible. Let's go on. Okay. Uh, secondly, is Guyana expected to basically reach out to Trinidad and any other um, persons that would have been involved in this whole oil spill thing to offer any sort of help when it comes to cleaning up? And um, it has become an international event, tier three event, so a number of international bodies have been um, approached. If we have any capacity to deal with this matter, and you know, like we have already forced Exxon, they did not want to bring the cap and stock here, stock. They, they um, under the new license, one of the new licenses, they now have to have one resident in the country. So if you have a well blowout, they can address that issue. Um, they have to have a subscription with a number of other agencies. But if we have any capacity, then we are willing to share. We are willing to share with any, our neighbors. Um, taking the same oil spill into, into consideration, are you concerned that at the rate um, the, the Starbuck block, at the rate we're pumping oil and producing, are you concerned that, that there is a, a possibility that the same fate could Befall Guyana. That a vessel could sink. A vessel yeah, coming to. to over that earth. a vessel could sink. That one of the, the FPS was out there. Uh, any a fate like that could happen to any country. Tobago. It happened in Barbados. It could. Uh, I mean, it could happen in Barbados. It could happen offshore of Saint Vincent. It could happen offshore of Saint Kitts. What are you asking me? This could happen. You are asking me. How are we unique in that, that a vessel could sink anywhere in the world? What makes you so confident? So you're, are you saying that the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadine, because of a potential threat of a vessel that could sink off their shore, must now invest in capacity to prevent that? You know what it takes to invest in that? Might be the whole GDP of the island. So are you saying that again? That it doesn't make sense again. Let's go. What makes you so confident that the same rate, the same fate, would not befall Guyana's Starbuck block, 
where oil is produced at an accelerated pace. I dealt with that. Let's move on. At 645,000 barrels per day, being the current weight at which ExxonMobil is pumping the oil in Lysa 1, 2, and Payara, it will be ex exhausted in 2029. Isn't your government taking a gamble on the long-term development of the country by allowing this rapid rate of depletion? Are you, are you sure about this exhaustion? Where, who gave you that figure? Who gave you that, that the, Liza 1 and Liza 2 and Payar would be depleted by that? The numbers are ExxonMobil's numbers. So ExxonMobil, this is what we have that they submit to us. Because I saw it in the newspaper. It peaks, production peaks here, but these wells are functioning up to, to 2047. 2047. I knew you come with this nonsense because I saw it in the paper. So I asked for the production profile of each of the wells. You got to understand the difference between peak, peaking, plateauing, and production. It's a, it'll be lost on Glen Lyle and the others. Peaking and plateauing are two different things. So you're wrong. The wells would be functioning up to 2047. That is why, because these are the wells from which the gas will come to. We got to be extraordinarily stupid, and we are not. We're not Glen Lal. To, to be able to, to build a gas to energy project that relies on these wells to supply gas will come on stream 2025, and 2029, they don't have any gas. We got to be extraordinarily stupid to have that happen. Or he has to be stupid to think that. It is a nonsense. Yeah, go on. Yeah, good afternoon, Doc. Wendell Jeffrey, Channel 2 Headline News. You took time to point out the problems that the teachers' union have. They're not credible. They're they're, they're not forthcoming to the teachers and so on. But you have schools that are closed and parents are complaining about leaving the children at home by themselves. You and your government are concerned about the effects that this strike is having on the children. Yeah. What do you see as a best case scenario, not in the interest of the executive of the GTU, but of the children and the parents who are suffering? Yeah. We, we have seen a significant number of teachers going back to schools. You've had a few cases where head teachers have closed the school and disappeared. And I, if they continue to do that, there will be a different kind of disciplinary action. We're making it clear. Because you can, you can choose to withdraw your labor, but not to prevent other people from working. You have a free freedom to do that in this country. So we've seen more. The problem is a lot of people still are not sending the kids to school because they're here. Like, so I've seen the stats from some regions where 85% of the teachers are back in the classroom. Remember, you've had, in the past, you, you only had 70% turnout. But say 85% of the 70% torn out are back in the classroom. And still the students are not there. The teachers are there now. And when I look at 10% of the, the children are only uh, have returned to school. So we need to urge this to happen. And we need the same consideration to be, be, be given by the teachers to the children. Because we are, I didn't point out last week, you were not here. And I pointed out that we are now spending $670,000 per child per year. If you take $125 billion, we take out the money for the University of Guyana and for the gold program from the 135, which would be about $8 billion. So let's say 125 and you divide that by the 178,000, 180,000 school children in both 
in, in nursery, primary, and secondary. You would see the average we spend per child is just under 700,000. In a private school, the average term rent, um, fee is about $100,000. So 300,000 you pay per year. We're spending more than twice per child in the public education system. People are saying we need to focus on value for money. I saw some people even saying we must get rid of all these teachers who are unqualified. And because if you're spending that amount of money in value, uh, not um, like who have three subjects and all of that, because you do have teachers who have only three subjects teaching, that we must get rid of them. We don't want to do that. We want to make sure those teachers can also be trained. They have opportunities for upward mobility. But at that rate, at the rate they're getting at the lower end, they're already very competitive with people who have five subjects CXC and working in other sectors. So these things have to be looked at. Our commitment to do this. Some people are saying, oh, which we don't subscribe to, maybe you should privatize it. Give a, all the schools and give vouchers to parents. Let private schools operate and give each parent a voucher of $600,000 per year, and then let them choose where they want to send their children to school. And um, so it's a lot of, re we've had a lot of discussions on this, not that any of this is being agreed to, but I'm just telling you, but we have to think of the best way to get our children the best education. People are criticizing us for not taking tougher action against the 30% of people who don't sh show up, the teachers, the absenteeism on a routine day. We gotta, we gotta think about this, but you're right about this. We, we can't, we cannot pay people for the days they're not involved. The, the union had a go ongoing relationship with the, with the ministry, ongoing relationship. We remain committed to addressing the concerns of the teacher. But we have already seen there is a lot of bad faith in this. And until that's rectified and some level of credibility is reestablished and we know that they're acting only purely by concern for the teachers, it's hard to engage. So, so we gotta keep, we got to find ways of getting the school open and the children back in school. But we that's what I was asking. Ways. Do you have as a government in the interest, because it's obvious that there is a, you've got problems with the leadership of the teachers. But as a we parent- We may have to explore, if this is prolonged, we may have to explore online methods. In the whole period in COVID, almost a year and a half, most of the teachers did not work. And we had to find different means of getting tuition to the children. Some of the teachers were still, that's why I said most of them did not work, but received full pay, full pay, unlike the other sectors that had to work, like the teachers and other teachers, the medical and the discipline services, etc. So they received full pay. But I think what we did after COVID, we, we started re-emphasizing back the classroom environment. When most countries globally are going to a, a hybrid system of looking more at online methods and, and a combination of the classroom. So a, a few specialists can really do a great job using information technology. The ministry has been focusing on on a lot of this online, we have started focusing on a lot of that education, preparing the material, etc. So I think in the future we have to explore this. And if this persists for a long time, um, we may have to find alternate ways of making sure our children are educated. I know for, for single parents particularly, single parents, it's a problem because they have to work and now when they, the kids are can't go to school. The school was like a daycare. 
in a way. I, it's, 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 trust me, we're looking at this too. It's affecting a lot of single mothers. So finally, because I, I, as, as a parent, as a pastor, yes, I'm, yes, I'm yes. getting complaints from About parents. That. Would you like to talk to the parents or, or, or where, where do yeah, the we, parents we, go? We should from engage here? a bit more with the parents to find maybe alternate ways of keeping the children engaged or, or um, getting the, the tuition at home. We have to find ways um, because Mr. Light said this will continue indefinitely. But he asked on the, and but the same person says he doesn't know how many teachers are striking now. Down from he knew the first week sixty percent, but didn't know now how much how many struck last week. Twenty percent or or twenty percent. So we have to we have to be we have to be sympathetic to the parents and to the some of the teachers who are doing a, a great job. You know they are holding classroom in many Georgetown schools. The teacher they are, they are working. The schools are working and the children are getting tuition. And in those communities where the parents, sometimes parents look for any excuse to I found this to take the children out to school, they need to understand if they're making excuses even when the school is functioning. I found a couple of cases like that in the quarantine. Then they, they're denying the children. They're holding these children back because the other schools that are functioning, those kids are moving forward with the curriculum. Dennis. Yes, Mr. Jaglio, Dennis Chabral, Demarari. Sir, rather than going the route of considering online tuition, why not meet with the union to discuss the pay issue? They, they, this is a totally unreasonable. We made that clear. Have you seen the demand of the union from 2019 to now? Have you seen their demand? If we accede to that demand, then there is there is in what will you that will put a teacher at 500,000 per month we're we're in this region or any country at our stage of development where would the, you you get you get that pay like for a graduate teacher you can't get it and so that is their demand their demand is there with these large percentages we have shown even with the percentages we give, we give so far, which are modest, but that has caused a 61% growth in the wages bill in, from 2020 to now. Are you saying we shouldn't pay, have any regard to, to sustainability? To where, what if we start, they're talking about depletion. What if the oil prices go in the, in the future years? Who are we gonna fund this? And when, when we do that, what are we going to say to the nurses, nurses or the policemen? Or you think we should ignore totally the sugar workers? What are we going to say to them? This is it. And this concept of the, you know, that you have to go back now and address what they settled, they accepted that they, they moved on from 2019 now, they're making demands from that. Even when APNU didn't consider their demand, they're making it. They're making demands from 2019. I, I maintain that we have done more than any government has done. For the education sector is not suffering from a lack of resources or commitment. That is what we're doing. But it cannot all go into wages and salaries. We have just, you're not dealing with the issue of qualification. So we must pay just... So a, a teacher, if we give a, an unqualified teacher, the same three subjects or four subjects, CXE, you give them the percentages that you, they want, will end up at $200,000 a month. The public servant with five CXE or the person who goes into the private sector is now making between 90 to 130 in a bank with five subjects CXE. That is the kind of unreasonableness unreasonableness that is happening. But isn't that what the negotiation process is for, so that you can lay out your, your yeah. counter arguments and they can lay out but their arguments? They had, I just explained to you that those arguments were made several times. They had a continuous engagement. You're asking to engage the ministry now, 
They are asking for that, one of their demands, to engage the ministry on the letter that they wrote the minister, including wages, and they had an engagement, and they had a meeting scheduled for, the, for, for three weeks after that, which was the 21st of February, and thereafter, every month, they will meet in the third week to meet and discuss these issues, and they went on strike. They and had the, an engagement. Are you saying that those successive meetings that you're referring to were to discuss the wages issue? They were, they, those, were they to discuss the wages issue? They were discussing all the issues that came that they wrote on. They wrote a letter with a number of issues, 40-something issues. The ministry had addressed nearly 30 issues. But the thing is that nobody holds the union. You're not asking the same. You're not getting the same robustness when the union. You didn't ask Mark Light for the audited statements. You ne have never done that. It's always about the government. You, you, no, no, no. But that is not true, Mr. Jagdeo. Yes. Okay, so you have... I asked it. all of them in relation to the match from the very day it was out. That is a misrepresentation of the truth. So... so so does it matter that the budget of the education sector, have you report that it grew by 162% in from 2020 to now? Have you looked at the, the disaggregated that? It's easy. It's in the public records. It's 162% from 50 odd billion dollars to 135 billion dollars. It is something billion dollars increase in a few, a three, four years. Where does that say that this government is already spending a large sum of money on the education sector and it has grown enormously? Where in the world can you find that in four years a budget for a sector has grown by 162%? Where in the world? And are you saying it's all about wages? Notice Nothing about building the schools, but the same people complaining, oh, we don't have enough classrooms, we don't have enough textbooks. We put aside $2.5 billion to buy textbooks. So forget all of that. Forget the improvement in the classrooms. Forget building new schools. That's the commitment of this government. You show me any government, any part of this world, that in four years have increased the budget for education by 162%, and then we can talk. You show me that. And because that never gets represented. It's always these, oh, what percentage? What is the livable wage? You gotta, you gotta present. Any, any self-respecting media would be balanced and present, project the whole picture, show the commitment. I've never seen a story like that, never seen it. Where not a single government in the world, I would tell you, has done that in four years. Mr. Jagadio, dear, even um, representatives of our government have said that the Ministry of Education is not authorized to negotiate wages and salaries. Mm -hmm. So then, which agency is responsible? Which representative of the government? I'm not going to disclose my sources, sir. Well, then I can't answer that question. Well, I remain, it, it, my, I my stance remains. Uh, but so but any, seriously, any, sir. Because I'd like to hear which, so then I can answer, maybe no, he was no. misrepresented or, or what? So is the Ministry of Education tasked no, with no, the responsibility no. of negotiating so wages and salaries? Me, tell me this, that they presented, the union knows they didn't present a list of demand to the president. They wrote the Minister of Education. The Minister of Bushy Education. It. All discussions with the union are led by the Ministry of Education. Let me tell you that. When the president met with the, with the teachers, not the union, met with the teachers, he met with them as citizens of this country to listen to their concerns. That obviously influenced not just some of the adjustments, but also the allocation of the budget for their concerns. Their concerns when you met with teachers from the hinterland, a lot of them were concerned. We don't have teachers housing. We don't have proper classrooms. We need, we need more desks in the classroom. The furniture is not falling apart. Some, some washroom facilities. They raise a lot of the issues. That's where the budget is going. 
and budget. Those things are important too for the same teachers you are talking about, but also for the students. Ultimately, it's our children that matter. Ultimately. And so, this is, this is important. So, um, just to get it clear, I clarify to you are that you? all the engagements with the union are dealt with through one ministry, not with. Are you ruling out the negotiations and wages and salaries? No, with I'm the not union. ruling out anything. I'm not ruling out anything. I'm just telling you what the facts are. Okay. The facts are. I made it clear. You gave a figure of about seven hundred million yeah. billion dollars that teachers will lose in terms of pay for being in strike. By your calculation, about how many teachers will lose that seven hundred million? Remember, they said sixty percent a day. No, no, no. I said that fifty percent. I said if if fifty percent. So I use a hypothetical figure. I said. If 50% had struck, they said 60%. So I said, if 50%, this is what the sum will be. Now they are changing everything. So this will not be guesswork. This will be based on the actual number of teachers as prepared by the reports that come from the region. And I suspect if someone who was not striking um, got their wages deducted. There will be a grievance mechanism to ensure that that person can then make a claim, I was not striking and my money was deducted, and they, once that's proven, they could get their money. Similarly, if we deduct, if we deduct, um, if we don't deduct from someone who has been striking, and then it subsequently turned out that person was, was striking, then you can reserve the right to come back and uh, do the adjustment later. So no one is treated unfairly in that process. Only people who have chosen to withdraw labor will have their, their pay deducted based on that principle. Thank you. So there will be a mechanism now to ensure fairness too. So even if you get the numbers, you know, like a few people get caught up in it unfairly, they can seek redress. Hey, good afternoon, Dr. Jagu. Sharvin with Kite Shore, Sharvin Belgrave. Um, just before I move into my questions, um, just for no, some... No, no, move into your question first, not just before. You move no, to your I, question. I want yeah. some clarity on what you mentioned about the 604. If you can explain to us how is it that um, the project live is going to reach to 24 to 7, based on the figures that Exxon have given you. And the reason why I'm asking this, hear me out before you answer. The reason why I'm asking this, if you check Exxon's website, right, and they give an overview of these three projects, it, it says... In these first three projects, there's an estimated 1.7, 1.8 billion barrels of oil. Um, they're currently producing at 645, and Exxon itself has said that by 2025, they would have taken out already from these three projects some 500 million barrels. That would leave like 1.2, uh, 1.3, let's say 1.3 billion. Yeah, but here now, your culture is not great with numbers, and they distort a lot of numbers. You just should look at the pro. What you should ask is for the proof production profile submitted by Exxon. So Exxon has submitted the production profile and up to the end year. This is what it looks like. It's peak in by the end of the, maybe by 2029, 20, 2030, and then it declines. So this is precisely why, for Kaichor's new sake, this is precisely why that your investments now have to go. That is why you need to license new projects to bring them on stream so that as the older wells start peaking and declining, the new ones start peaking and therefore you can levelize your production around a stable, around a stable number in the future. So it makes it very when Kaicho News talks about oh, we're not, we're just investing investing in and we're not ring fencing and we can take that money and spend it out now they're not thinking you have provided even yourself the argument for it by pointing this out there is that's the justification if you think it through carefully carefully that wells will peak and then decline 
And if you want to be producing stably to ensure that the income comes in over the long term stably for the country, you have to constantly approve new projects so that their, their, their timing, the peaking, levels out the cycle. It's a level out, out the cycle. You've provided the answer yourself without knowing it, why we have to continue licensing new projects. You got to think it through. Thank you for the clarification, uh, Dr. Jagdeo. Um, not a question. I, I think I've asked this before here as well. Um, you I've think asked, you asked it before? Move well, on. No, no, I'm asking move it again. Yes. Just no, so no, 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 no. I'm, I'm move on. Hey, I said before, move on, man. Let me um, give somebody you, else. You've yeah. maintained that Guyana is not an investor in this yeah. harbor block because we didn't bring any capital to the table. But the Exxon head says by foregoing the profits, we are definitely a co-investor. Why have you maintained that yeah. Guyana is not well, an investor? Well, I, I made it clear. I made a whole big argument. I just made it clear that you have to invest. We can Somehow, this is the same old philosophy. Don't, don't increase, don't ring, um, ring fence, don't approve new projects, take all you can now, and then that means no exploration in the future, no new project being developed. Eat every cent now, take it, spend it all up now. And then what happens? In the future, you have what's happening here. Production declines, nothing have, you don't have a future source of income. And therefore, you can't sustain what the, the developments and even the social sector spending that you're making now. It is, it's the core philosophy that we're arguing against here, the philosophy that lives only for today. It's an up new philosophy, and they, they do it you know, in a way that, uh, but not, not just happened, some other, AFC, all of these people, Ram Jatani, you listen to Ram Jatani, he's a clown. Talking about this, up to a couple of days ago, I hear him talking. They want, as I said before, spend all the money now. Save all the money for the future. So, two contradiction. Then don't invest in anymore, or don't ring fence now. Take all the money from Exxon. But we must get production higher in the future for, to sustain future increases. They don't see it's contradictory. It's convenient. And, and so that, go back to my original argument when I dealt with this question. It was that philosophy I'm talking about. It is, so, and let's move on. Anyone else? Yeah. Dr. Jaglio, the Guyanese critic for Daybreak News. Um, citizens are becoming very frustrated with your babysitting of Kaicho News and are wondering if you are a shareholder in Kaicho News. Since what you do on Thursday is what carries Kaicho News and affords Kaicho News readability, why do you continue to babysit Kaicho News? It's becoming very tis distasteful for the citizens of this country. Um, I don't know. Um <laughs> oh, to answer that, yeah, but every week it's like the same, same thing with this Kaicho News. But as I just said, Kaicho News is now the, the new nation to the PNC and the mirror to the PPP. It's a party organ, the Glen Lal political party. <laughs> so you can't expect much truth in it, and he has this obsession. Now very clever gentleman, but I shouldn't be saying this, but really he, he misses everything. He misses, anytime there is an issue that has nuances, you, ex you know Glenn Lyle will not understand it. And he has some people stoking his ego. Um, so they tell him, oh, you're doing a great job there, etc. cetera. He, he actually believes it. So I, I'm, I don't know. If I were a reporter there, and I get these questions to come and ask, it's really a rough thing to come every week and ask the same questions that don't make no sense sometimes. Really, it's tough. It is a really tough thing. So I don't wanna, and that's why I don't want, I might be babysitting the reporters, but not the newspapers. 
and they'll be sitting the reporters. I don't want them to face the um, like the brunt of what I have to say. If Glenn Lau is here, you'd hear a different story. I'll, I'll deal with him. Let me, let me come back to the press conference. Dr. Dr. Jagdeo, um, recently two short but damning statements were issued by the Deeds Registry, um, suggesting that the church units is unregistered for the last 10 years, and the Auditor General that it has not been audited since um, 1989. Uh, why was it the, the, your party... I explained that, you know, like you came you explained in it earlier? Yes, I explained it later. Does yeah. the party plan to act no, on things no, like that? I explained that purely legally we should act and the conclusion of this will be the derecognition of the union but i don't think it's a wise thing to do at this stage and it will um they would just use it propaganda wise like how they use everything they put everything to race so we hate this union and all of that stuff so I, I believe that we have to go in forward, take firmer steps um, against the union, but also that the membership of the union have a responsibility to hold the leadership to account. I do hope that someone, I, I can share the rules here, and I hope that you will um, examine it, um, particularly in relation to the general secretary, the point about general secretary that I, I raised. Dr. Jagdeo, recently the head of the teachers, the president of the teachers union, um, I think with an attempt to put some wind in their sails for the last teachers that are left standing, told teachers that when they lose the house and the care, the government will give them housing and they will get free transportation. Please explain what is the government's stance on that. You know, someone someone sent that to me a little video image so i didn't know it was mark light saying this i thought it was somebody else and i think it's a little a little weird kind of thing i, I don't know if it's me, me alone got that impression but like he was actually sincere in saying this stuff or or a little delusional so he was saying this and i don't think here it's either you're joking about this because you can't be serious about this. But he looks like he was serious. So how do we deal with that sort of thing? It's, I don't know um, how something so far, where is the logic in all of this? You lose your house. And how he came to losing house? He was telling teachers that if their mortgages run up and then the bank come and sees their homes, this is the effort they have to make to keep the struggle going. And even when they run out of gas, oh, they could put you know, a tree brick in the backyard and use fireside. Oh, really? I hope it starts with the union leadership that they start cooking in fireside for us because they need to account for the $2 billion of union Jews, first of all, that they cook in the backyard for us and, and stuff like that. Because it's not going to come to that. Teachers, I think, as you've seen already, there a significant number of teachers have gone back, and they recognize that too, or didn't strike either their, their being clever with the numbers. I, that's why I dealt with that issue earlier. You weren't here about him saying he has a credibility gap that now they don't know what the number is. It could be 20% who struck from their high of the first day they announced 60% were striking the first week. And now they've said they don't know how many struck. So 20%. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna respond to everything they're saying. But that's a weird sort of thing, uh, weird. You can, I find it very weird, yeah. Can the citizens and the teachers expect the government to maintain its sincerity in light of the fact that on the teacher's side, from the teachers' union, it's being, you could obviously see there's a political motive. Mm -hmm. um, can the teachers expect the government, no matter what happens on the teachers' union side, to ex Press, continue to express sincerity towards the teachers. No, no, this, this is it. The teachers, 
will have our full support. We, they, and teachers should best understand. Like that's why when one teacher was talking about, oh, wages and salary in relation to the growth in GDP. Everybody knows, anybody with any economic sense would know that they don't correlate. And, and, and uh, I, I said it about APNU, and maybe he's influenced by the leader of the opposition who did the same thing in parliament. He took um, public servant wages and then deflated by the gross national product, which is, you have, to, it doesn't make much sense especially in a in an period when, as I, I mentioned earlier, that the level of economic growth, it doesn't translate necessarily with the same percentage increase in revenue, in revenue. So I, the teachers will continue to have our full support if teachers want to get, uh, improve themselves with training they have a government that is providing now, prepared to provide all the resources for them to improve themselves. Scholarships fully paid for by the government, any one of them, from the most junior teachers, the ones with five, three subjects or five subjects, they can join a program now to get a certificate or a degree. They can join that. If they don't have the required admission, the requisite to get admitted into an institution of higher learning, we have a remedial program now for those teachers as well as many others. Imagine 4,000 or 14,000 teachers already on this scholarship. They're benefiting from it. That's a large number, leaving out the, the 2,000 who had been trained in the last two years. Teachers, that's a large number. Where in, a, in which country in the world nearly uh, one, uh, what, it would be nearly a third of your teachers, about 30% or so, of your teachers in a couple of years are on scholarship. It's, it's, and paid for by the government fully. They don't have to, they don't have to pay for this themselves. It is, it's not about a fight with the teachers. We want the best for our children, we want the best for our teachers, but it's, it's the sector as a whole, not just, teachers are one important part of the sector, one important part and the quality of tuition, but we got to get new means of learning. IT in the classroom, we have to get better classrooms, we have to get new learning material, we have to get better facilities, schools, etc. All of these things are part of your investment in education for our children. That is what we want to look at the whole from which teachers benefit. Dr. Jack Dio, Samuel Sugnan in NCN News. Mm -hmm. So recently you met with regional and other engineers from the Ministry of Public Works. Can you enlighten us about uh, that meeting? Oh, okay. Um, we were just going through um, the budget provisions for this year and also the delay in some of the projects from last year. The President has been doing this a lot too. Um, a lot of projects have been awarded um, in, uh, in Linden, in region. For example, we've had now um, nearly $700 million of project in Region 10. These are community roads that are still in varying degrees of completion from, that were awarded last year and um, in some of the other regions too. So we want those completed. A lot of these are concrete roads, etc. So we said, first of all, they got to be completed within the next two months. And then we urge the engineers to do a number of things. So quality control, testing of the concrete, and testing the asphalt, ensuring that these things are laid according to specification, that the groundwork, etc. Because we have had a lot of good projects, but we have had a few shoddy projects. So these were engineers from all the regions to say just focus on quality too and you'll be held responsible for these projects. So you have to make sure that the quality of the material and everything else, the output is real and that it's, it's of a quality that we pay for. So it's, it's that because these are pe the people 
with who are directly responsible for oversight on the ground, the engineers. Under them, they have a series of um, the quantity, like the, the um, guys who work on bills of quantity, etc. The, the, the quantity clerk, clerks, the clerks who work examining this on, on each of the projects, etc. So that was it. And then looking to ensure that the budget for 2024, that we move forward very early with the tendering process so those projects can happen. Now, APNU says in the budget there is nothing for people. But we have about 100 billion for community roads, nearly 3,000 community roads across the country. And in the hinterland, in, in, so, so yeah, teachers might be striking, but we are, we are building the entire several kilometers of roads from, from Hosororo all the way to the Mabruma settlement and in, around the settlement. Kilometers of roads that were just urban places. Now all, people from Hosororo right into the settlement could drive on concrete roads. The same thing we started from Moruka to Quebana. The school at Quebana will be, will be over $2 billion. Um, the Matakai sub-district, all of these, the internal roads. So a lot of those things will change, change the lives of people on the ground, proper infrastructure. And, you know, someone living here in Georgetown, or maybe not Georgetown, but any part of the country that has good roads to drive on, would think, why are you, why are you focusing on this? But you live in some of these communities. And then, then you would understand how important a proper road is to your livelihood for the children to go to school and everything else too and so so that sort of thinking we can't be one track in our thinking we can't be a single track we have a lo lot of other projects you know the project to take the four lane to the Suze Dyke Highway um, that's being worked on we've awarded the contract up to Busby Dam now from Busby Dam, it will go to Garden of Eden and then Garden of Eden to the, to the highway. The main road contract is gonna start soon where we're paving from about the, the stadium all the way back to the airport and widening the road slightly. Um, that's under the IDB program. The Linden Suzdike Highway, we got the bid in, so the award should um, be done shortly and that paving will take place. The East Coast Road, we're pushing ahead with it. Norton even had confusing which road we were repaving. Let me tell him for, so that he does not mix up again. We are repaving through the ministry the road from the roundabout to Better Hope on both sides, the carriageway, the four lane road, because um, where the new project had started at Better Hope. So that whole carriageway will be upgraded. A lot of those things happening. We're working on Barbies. Um, I'm going to um, tend shortly for the road to in the, a four-lane road and in parts of Barbies, New Amsterdam, coming out to probably about Tain and then coming down on the way to um, from Crabwood Creek to maybe about 20 kilometers from Crabwood Creek, um, where the most populous areas are, upgrading the Black Bush Polar Road. Uh, almost these are important pieces of infrastructure. We had a review on the hospitals, where the Chinese are. They said they'll complete all six hospitals, the $30 million facility by the end of the year. That means we now know we have to get the personnel to manage these hospitals because there are new hospitals everywhere. We now are preparing the budget for how we upgrade Bartica, Bess, Linden Hospital, we have spent another 30 million US in Linden to upgrade the hospital. That's a massive uh, um, upgrade of the hospitals and the facilities there, Bess, um, Bartica, and I think it does, there's one other area, maybe Saudi. Um, so a lot of these, and then the, the other projects, the big projects in New Amsterdam. You saw the president was there, he spoke about that not only being a a massive new hospital for New Amsterdam, 
uh, which is $160 million in New Amsterdam, new hospital. But we decided once that's completed, we'd rehabilitate the old hospital to, for the mental, mental health. Um, and that it will become a teaching hospital or two. And uh, we are working with the University of the West Indies maybe to start a program there for nursing. It becomes a teaching hospital in, those, in, in that area. There, there are lots and lots of things that we are working on, and, and it's happening whilst, whilst we focus on improving education too. So it's that kind of discussion we have with the staff ongoing all the time to see that we get the programs going. This morning, the president was meeting with ministers um, to ensure that they have a greater oversight of their own programs so that you can go to tender very early because sometimes the ministries wait very late in the year until September or so to go to tender. So by the time you award, the projects are rolled into the next year. Um, so a lot of that sort of discussion takes place at the government level on a daily basis in a routine, routine way. I didn't even know they posted a picture about that. Yeah. And secondly, um, can you tell us about the discussions with the visiting IMF team, your discussions? Oh, it is it's a, just a courtesy, um, courtesy call by the deputy managing director. I think it's one of the first times a deputy managing director of the fund has come to Guyana. Um, they, we've had executive directors who've come. The deputy managing director is here. And we had a great meeting with him. And, and we spoke about, he, he, he had a good words. He said, the IMF is available to you. You know, we, since 2006, we didn't have an IMF program. We, we exited that program, the ESAF, and then the subsequent programs since 2006. But we have had a consultative relationship, particularly like with mo every country has this Article 4 consultation. So that is what we have, but it's not an IMF program. So he has um, he's come and said, we're, we're happy what's going on in Guyana. Guyana could be a model for many countries. We're pleased with the reforms. Um, we want to work with you. We, we are um, users for policy advice, etc. And there are a couple of areas we need to look at. Um, we, we need our financial sector has benefited significantly from, from CARTAC and the others through stress testing. You recall when the world had banks collapsing, we stress test all of our institutions. They're considered very sound institutions. But now we need to grow the financial sector. The banking system needs to grow in sophistication because our economy is changing. So one of those areas we, we need to look at is that, how we grow, and maybe IMF has a lot of expertise in that, grow in financial sophistication. And the second is the capital markets, capital markets development. You've heard the recent issue about the stock exchange, but we need a proper capital market that incentivizes but also penalize companies from going public or not going public. And then some, the rules are clear and to have them listed on the stock exchange. Government can grow the exchange unless you have private companies listing on the exchange and willing to go through the, the transparency requirements if you list on an exchange. That's when you have your shares traded. Then you can see a big relationship between growth in profitability, dividends, earnings, and the movement of your share prices. But it can't be done otherwise. A lot of companies complain, but they're not unwilling to do that. But also the government has a fiduciary responsibility and to ensure that even the, in the private company, public companies that are operated almost privately without listing on the exchange that they protect small shareholders because small shareholders need to be protected. So we need to take that responsibility seriously now. And we need to create a greater condition for 
the encouragement of the capital market. We ourselves may be prepared in the future to put some instruments to be traded on the exchange. You know, like having a public company that Guyanese could invest in and then put that on the exchange where the government is co-investing with Guyanese for a project that is lucrative. We have some ideas and then hopefully trigger uh, some growth in the volume of shares traded on the exchange. But this is one area that we, we can discuss a bit with them. But there is no, they, they're very pleased with the engagement as was reflected in the report that went to the board recently on the, on the, um, the when they did the Article 4 consultations. Yes. Yes, please. Good afternoon. Uh, Kim Al King with Oil Now. Following up on your response to Samuel's question, the IMF official said Guyana can be used as a model for many countries. On what specifically? Well, first, first of all, we have, we have been able to avoid the, what is considered the resource course where you have an appreciation of the currency. With, you've been able to increase the budget significantly, as you can see. I don't want to go back through that, but you've seen the budget grow significantly. But in those still being able to make sure that, that we don't have um, what is considered the resource cost, the change in relative currency. They have seen the areas we are spending the money in. The areas will promote future growth, so capacity building. Our bulk of our spending, if you look at the education and health, $235 billion of the $1.1 trillion is in education and health. Those, some countries don't spend that money in education and health because we want a world-class education and health. That lends itself to healthier people, more educated people for the future. That's an investment in the future. Some countries invest it in everything else, and it gets frittered away. Thirdly, investment in infrastructure, power plants, to make the price of power cheaper, etc. Cost of living impact, but also to make industries more viable. Co-investing in agriculture, etc., open up infrastructure for a more diversified economy, creating a, a framework and incentivizing for non-oil and gas investments. Look at the evolution of our fiscal incentives for investments in education and health care now. If you invest in those areas, you don't pay any corporate tax. We removed the corporate tax in 2020, the first budget we came into office and also remove taxes on equipment for health sector. So you can bring in sophisticated equipment, you don't pay taxes. We have done, we have reversed a lot of the APNU anti-business investments, investment, anti-investment taxes, like fat on machinery and equipment. We have reversed that too. We have created more incentives for hotels. They now get why you think a, a proliferation of international hotels investment here. We have removed the, we have, we have given a 10 years tax holiday now for the international, their hotels so that they can support their income. So that again is another area too. Then we have a sovereign wealth fund that we made it clear that beyond a certain level, there would be a formula based deduction and savings that would take place beyond a certain level. So it did not do like other countries, like Norway, 25 years, 19 years for, from the establishment of, from oil production to the establishment of the um, fund, and then another six years to start saving. They took 25 years. We can start saving from 2025 if our revenue start, goes beyond five billion. And, and a significant share of it, 90% gets saved above revenue above nine, five billion dollars. So a lot of those things were, and, and the same fiscal discipline that we exercised in the past, that we are exercising now, I think there are elements of a model as to how you 
countries like ours that get a windfall can utilize them without harming, can address people's immediate concerns. So we have done that. We have, we have given the teachers, the pensioners more. We're doubling old age pension by, uh, by next year. And we are giving our children more money. We're spending more on disabled without, um, without, so you're spending on the social sector much more, but you're not making the spending unsustainable. That is, that is, I think, those are some elements of the model. Some updates on some oil matters. Are you in a position to advise today on when government expects to approve the Whiptail project? Um, the original schedule of end of the first quarter still holds. Okay. What about completion for the natural gas strategy? Um, that will take a bit longer. I can tell you the time. We, that will take a bit longer. Okay. What about the auction? Contract the awards? The auction, so right now they're assessing. Remember, they're another two weeks. So by now, the report has to come to cabinet. The report, um, as soon as the minister brings the report to cabinet, I'll, I'll inform you. Finally, the decision on proposals for the refinery, how close are you to a decision on a contractor? Oh dear, there are several of, um, iterations of this because some people who said they could raise the money when, they, when we look at their track record and their, their submission as to where they will access the financing, it's not credible. You have to constantly go back to the drawing board. Okay, that's it. Right. Thank you.